You kids, get out of my... Oh, hey everybody, this is Paul Gilbert, and welcome to the JHS Show. How you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's the morning and I've had coffee. Woohoo! What is the first album you bought with your money? I think it was either Crazy Horses by the Osmond Brothers or The Man Who Sold the World by David Bowie or Are You Experienced? Jimi Hendrix. Why guitar? Why not harpsichord or banjo? Because you can stand up with guitar. And when I, when I started playing, I wanted to bounce around. I had the energy of a little kid. So I thought, you know, I loved Elton John, but I thought, you know, you, he's sitting on a bench most of the time. The same thing with drums, you gotta sit down. I wanted to stand up and, and, and jump. Very serious question. If you had to live without pizza or coffee, which one would you live without? Oh, pizza. I, I'm officially addicted to coffee now. I didn't even try coffee until probably four or five years ago. Between you and me, mm -hmm. Who would win a staring contest? <laughs> I think you would win. Let's try. You're known as a fast guitar player. Can you explain that? <laughs> uh, I, I think I can. Well, I was 11 when I got Van Halen 1, the first Van Halen album, and Frank Marino and Mahogany Rush live for Christmas. And both those guys played fast and, and really good. And so I wanted to, wanted to do what they did. Amazingly, I, after working at it i could a bit people would respond you know that was sort of the thing at the time so i kept going down that path and uh, i ended up with a reputation as a fast guitar player it, it was a little silly to me at some time which is why things like the drill came out where the uh, picks on the end of a drill i'm just making fun of the whole genre pick it's really a lot cooler if you've got you know, three picks mounted on the end of a drill but even that you know no one knew it was silly and they all thought oh you know well maybe somebody knew it was silly <laughs> Um, but it, uh, it's pretty silly. Who are your main musical influences? People you really love? Oh, man. Well, it's, it's all the stuff I grew up with, which was 60s pop, 70s rock, 70s pop, which was on the radio when I was a kid. And uh, initially, I didn't really hear guitar so much because in the Beatles records, the loudest thing is, is the vocals and the tambourine. You know, somewhere, once in a while, you'd get a riff, you know. <laughs> That, that was cool, but mainly I was listening to the vocals. I wanted to be a singer, and then I got a cassette recorder, and I recorded my voice, and I went like, well, I don't know if that's going to fly, because you know, I didn't really like my voice. But I had these long fingers, and, and, and the more I played guitar, the more that seemed to come together. So that led me to listen to Jimmy Page, and, and I got into more guitar music. And then at a certain point, I started to be, I don't know, jealousy is the right word. I didn't want keyboard players to have the upper hand in terms of songwriting, and I remember Marcia My Dear came on the radio, Beatles tune. And I thought, if, if that song never existed and it, and it just dropped into my head one day, would I be able to get it out without a piano? And I thought, no, that would be like a, a wasted song because I can't play piano very well. And I thought, well, that's dumb. So I, I want to develop enough facility with chords, the kind of chords that piano players use, where I'd be able to you know, where I don't have that limitation of being the, the, the guitar player that only knows guitar chords. So I started going through all the 70s pop that I grew, grew up with, Elton John and Carpenters and Todd Rundgren and, of course, Beatles and Beach Boys, and trying to figure out 
th those chords. It's stylistically, it's no longer heavy metal. You know, you right. get more into like uh, was it? Um, you know, I'm sure it was McDonald? I, I wish. albums your fans need to listen to oh man robin trower toss up between bridge of size and robin trower live i mean bridge of size is the one that you'll like the most because it's, it's the best record the live one when i listen to it i just go like i don't know why i'm playing because he's already done everything that i ever want to do on that record it's just like it, 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 it gets it done. He, he, it's, yeah. You know, I, I'm, anything i'm doing is just an imitation of that so i'm going to use those two as one okay Oops, Wrong Planet by Utopia. Because when, okay. when I was 17, I was in a band with a bunch of older guys. The bass player gave me that record. And, uh, you know, I was at seven, I was 17, so I was, you know, listening to Ozzy with Randy Rose and Van Halen. I was an Iron Maiden. I was a metal fan, you know, 80s metal fan, because it was yeah. the 80s. And he gave me Oops, Wrong Planet by Utopia and the song Trapped. When Chasm Sultan, the bass player, screams, You got the break out! You know, it's 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 so intense, and the chords are so cool. Third one that they need to listen to, Streets, the the uh, lead singer of, of Kansas, Steve Walsh. Okay. You know, for whatever reason, he was out of Kansas. I don't know the history. Early '80s, he forms his new band called Streets. Mike Slamer is the guitar player, and it's one of the most stunning guitar records. He's got kind of that Randy Rose, like a little bit of a harmonizer on the guitar. Most of the records are just a single guitar, like Van Halen 1. Yeah. There's hardly any overdubs on it. Huge tone. Uh, and it's just, just the, the songs are good. Steve Walsh is killing. And the whole record is, is great. And, it, it, you know, nobody knows about it. My fingers are getting cold. <laughs> This is a burning question. All right. Is a hot dog a sandwich? My first thought is yes, because it's two pieces of breadish material with with a filling. The, the, the issue is if it, the bread has to be a certain shape. Or is the issue that the bread is attached? Because a sandwich is... Well, it doesn't stay attached. The hot dog always comes off. Mine stay attached. Yours stay attached? You're telling me that in your whole life, your hot dog is always separated. I think most of the time, at some point, it, it, it separates. And it is a sandwich because the bread does separate. Yeah, because then you've got two pieces of, of, of breadish material with a yeah. filling. That answer tells us that any object with a single connected piece of bread is not a sandwich. Well, it could be an open face sandwich, but then they have to, the bread pieces have to be like facing the same direction. Here's a hot dog sandwich. Here's a hot dog sandwich. Now here's the trick. 
you do it twice. Okay. The third one, you got to do something different. You have to. That's the songwriting trick. So, Here's a hot dog sandwich. Repeat it. Here's a hot dog sandwich. The third one, you do something. I like that tune. You can have it. It's a co-write. Uh, hey, you know, you can, whatever. Take this, Leonard McCarty. ton of music over the years what what is like your trick you, you get those lucky moments of, of inspiration where you, you stumble upon some little phrase or something you know when you're in your 20s those can be whole songs you know you wake up in the morning like McCartney did oh I got this little ditty in my head it's, oh, it's, it's the best pop song ever written by chance you know the, right you know, wakes up with yesterday and I think in your 20s your, your brain is so amazing that you might get four or five songs that just drop in and they're completed and you just got to do a tweak here or there. Yeah. That doesn't happen so much. Now I get, now I get, you know, six or seven notes or a little riff and I just compile all those until I have enough that I can start editing. The trick is to, to be excited about it. If you're going like, uh, you know, I've got to write a song today, you, you won't get anything. You, you got to have, you find something that you like enough where you, where you actually want to do it and uh, just keep finding things that keep you interested. That's the trick, you know. As soon as you feel that you're self getting bored, you're you're barking up the wrong tree, and you got to find a new tree to bark up. If you were gonna write a song about Pi, how do you get in that? That's a that's a tough place to be in. Here in, in my neighborhood, there's a really good pie place down the street, and I'll ride get on my bike every day after dinner and, and ride down and get a slice. And you know, with all the strife and, and and things to argue about in the world, whenever I go to the pie place, just everybody's in a good mood. So this inspired me to just think. Like you can never get in an argument about pie, and that's that's how you start a song. You get you get a phrase. You can never get in an argument about pie. You can never get in an argument about pie. Play a major chord, drop your shield and sword. Yeah, you really have to try. It's just a food, unless you're gluten intolerant, and that would be so sad. Cause you couldn't help, cause you couldn't help, cause you couldn't help. And, and that's the, the, the curse of my songwriting existence is that I'm pretty unsatisfied with my singing voice at that level. So that's where the guitar saves me. And I could do my melody, you know. And, and suddenly I can hit the notes and, and my vibra vibrato makes sense. And of course I lose the message of the lyrics, but live, I, I'll, I'll, you know, I tell people what's going on with the song. That song is amazing. In a world full of people bickering over every single thing, I think Pi holds us together. <laughs>
when you realize I'm famous for playing guitar. <laughs> it was a gradual yeah. thing. The third Racer X show, we it was in Los Angeles, and we had discovered the uh, the unfortunate situation of having to pay to play. When if you wanted to do a club gig, you'd, the club would give you tickets, and you'd have to sell them somehow. And if you did, you could break even, pay for the rental truck and and you know whatever else yeah. expenses for the show. And if you know if you really sold a lot of them, you could actually make some money. But we were in, in like very happy to break even phase of our career if we could. And the third show, we had gone all out and we had rented like more PA, more lights. We got in a, a, a rental van for the gear. And I remember being in the rental van, like, you know, two crew guys next to me and and, and going like, if nobody shows up, I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay rent. We get to the Troubadour. I walk in and it was so packed that I could barely make it backstage. It was, it was like the fire marshal would have had trouble with this gig. There's so many people in the venue. And my heart told me, I may have a fighting chance of, of like actually being a guitar player as a job. And, uh, there were, you know, there are lots of, you know, little sparks of, of uh, inspiration before that. But that was the moment when I felt like this could work. Dinosaurs or aliens? Well, my, just my instinct tells me dinosaurs. Why is that? that? That was almost my career. You know, I wanted to be a paleontologist and find dinosaur bones. Really? So my mom gave me a shovel and, and a plot in the garden, and she said, go for it. You know, you can dig as deep as you want to find a dinosaur bone. Here's your shovel and your, and your plot. And I started to dig, and after 15 minutes, it was, you know, my arms started to get tired. I got blisters, and I thought, this is too hard. I didn't find anything. I didn't even find an arrowhead. That was the end of my career as a paleontologist. If E major was a color, what would it be? Uh, well, purple. If you could jump into the DeLorean, mm -hmm. go back into the past, and find yourself at 17 years old and say, hey, Paul, this is what you need to know. What would you say? Careful with perms. I'll say, I'll say that. Okay. Uh, s second, now this, I have yet to road test this, so I'm not sure, but maybe put the chorus after the distortion, because I'm getting a really good sound right now. <laughs> I'm kind of digging that. I've always had it before the distortion. How many years have you played chorus before distortion? Like like 40 plus. You know. So not in an effects loop, in series. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what he did in the 70s. Yeah. yeah. So, so and, and I was always listening to Alex Lifeson, and, and you know, I think that's what he did. It's okay. I mean, I've still got one before the distortion, you know. <laughs> something to it too but it's more smooth yeah i it's like more, the unit 80s i like univibe first i've always had chorus after What is your favorite instrument you own? Well, right now it's this one. It's got a really thick neck. It's got uh, mini humbuckers, which I'm digging. Yeah, under there, I've got magnets. I'm starting to, to tear off the wood so much that I, I put a little piece of rubber there. And uh, it, it just it just has a beautiful, you know, if you play, you know, sustain. It, it doesn't sustain as long as Nigel's imagination, right, but right. if your amp is loud, it might. If you weren't a guitar player at this point in your life, what would you be doing? I would like to be a drummer. Okay. That's, that's more fun. Yeah, I think so. Because there's no wrong notes. Ever. You know, if you go, do 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 or do 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 it's not like, oh, that, it's the wrong note. You know. If you were to have your own JHS signature pedal, mm -hmm. what would it be like? What would it do? The thing that comes to mind is, I, I used to go to flea markets when I was a kid, and I got this amp for like $5. It was a Montgomery Ward technical apparatus 
cast iron amp, or I think it was a PA actually, with, with these yeah. big stove knobs on it. And the, the tubes, some of them were clear, but a couple of them were black and had wires, big thick wires going to the top. My, my dad wired up a, a guitar jack into it, and I plugged in, and I had a, a guitar with a high output, like a super distortion pickup, and I hit an E chord really loud, and the amp did this. Went, boom. Yeah! And it, it shut off, because it just couldn't handle the, the power of, of a high output pickup, and then it like faded back in. There was something about that, that the amp, like, that was just suffering because it just couldn't, just like, I can't handle that, that was, that was attractive. And, of course, I wouldn't want it to actually shut off. But to go in that direction where you can feel, a, you know, the, the, what a tube does when the tube is going, like, this is a little too much for me. It's, it's really unique to what people, I think, dig about tubes. But, you know, if you can get that out of, out of the you know the magic that you do with the parts, the capacitors, parts, resistors, transistors. diodes, transistors, yeah. all the stuff that, that goes yeah. into a yeah. pedal. If you can channel some of that uh, some of that magic of the Montgomery Ward Airline technical apparatus black tube with wire on top that just goes like ah when you when you hit a, a chord hard, but dialable so it sounds sounds good in in a real you know rock and roll situation, that'd be nice. That's weird because that's exactly what i brought and i i put it on your board you didn't notice this well, thing oh man and it's got to have a shoe on it did i say that yeah look and it's got to have my name in, in in japanese katakana you're kidding me right <laughs> Can you make the knobs pink? I just, that's just what I thought you would like. The PG-14 to me it's the ultimate dirt channel box for a clean amp. We have a FET simulated tube amp, basically, yeah. that you can crank. So like That's a, why it like, feels so good. Like the Marshall sound or, you know, a small amp sound. So you have the amp with the ability to be cleanish or distorted. You're running it distorted and you're hitting it with more mids, and it just sounds amazing. Now, the, the when you hit it with the mids, does that also have one of those circuits that you would have for distortion that just use a different way or is it a whole different thing it's an op amp so super the mid section of this pedal is very clean it just simply pushes just really hard into that simulated tube fet thing yeah the more you push the mids the mids is distorting that mid frequency area in a really cool way and it's so, got and it's got knobs so you can adjust yeah. where the mid is yeah which which really changes the, the frequency the of way it feels and the way it yeah. distorts that's the thing I've, I've found with this with this pedal with the, with the PG14, is uh, it has more variety of how it sounds and how it feels than I think any distortion pedal I've ever played through. It's really yeah. the, the, the settings are important. Yeah. Is uh, because it it really has a different character depending on how it's set. I normally use those style pedals for light overdrive. I noticed as we work through this and hearing you play it it sounds like a Marshall on 10 with a fuzz face in front of it. And we're in a room at super low volume and that's an impossible sound to get, usually. Until now. Until now. I'm excited about it because I think it works with any amp and any playing style where you need distortion. I'm excited about it because it makes me play better and it's road tested. I just got back from a tour of Europe, played it every night and swapped it out with their stuff just to make sure. And it, it, it was the winner. I like pedals that make me go, ow! Oh. How tall are you? I am 
Six foot three. How tall are you? Six foot six. Oh man. Do you, do you hit your head on the on the door sometimes? I used to. Do, do, do you play basketball? Yeah. You want to go play basketball? Let's go play basketball. Let's play basketball. Here. Thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. I want to close out with a few things. First of all, I just want to let you know it was an amazing experience to create a custom distortion pedal for Paul Gilbert. His career spans decades and this has all the sounds he's ever wanted and a lot of things that he wanted going forward. And that was a real honor. And I want to also back up what he said when he said the knob positions really matter. You got to hear how Paul uses it, but I would use this in a totally different way because it covers so many sounds. One of my favorite sounds out of this box is that sound of like a fuzz face into a cranked Marshall. It's a really hard sound to get, but this nails it. So I'm really proud of that. If you're a big Paul Gilbert fan, which many of you are, I also recommend the TC Electronic Mojo Mojo. This is one of his staple drive pedals for years and years. He still uses it even in conjunction with this. Um, and it's fantastic. He first told me about it a year ago and I've been a big fan ever since. If you want to see more 
more demos of this pedal in the description below. There's tons of links. There's gonna be articles by the time this airs and all of that's great reading to get more in depth about it. Go to thejhsshow.com for shirts, especially the shirts that we're wearing. Paul Gilbert can't shred, Andy's shirt that says demo guys suck, Nick's shirt says drums suck, and the one that I wear from time to time, JHS pedal suck. Those are funny shirts, they're awesome conversation starters. You can go buy them at the website. And then also there's a Patreon. You can go and support what we're doing here at the JHS show. And other than that, you need to go do something else because this is like a one hour video. You need to go, go do stuff, bye.